Assalamu alaikum. Now with a brief introduction of the speaker of tonight, Brother Yasir Fazaka. Brother Yasir Fazaka, a special guest here today, is the Imam of Islamic Foundation in the city of Mission Wayaho, California, USA. He is also the teacher of Islamic studies at the American University, Virginia. Added to this, he is the president of the Eritrean Muslim Council in the US. He has graduated from Imam Saud University, Fairfax, Virginia, majoring in Islamic studies. He has done his MS in psychotherapy from Long Beach State University in California. This is with a brief introduction of the speaker of tonight. Now I request uh, Brother Yasser to deliver his speech. All praise is due to Allah. And may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I bear witness that no one is worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his final messenger. Indeed, the best of speech is the book of Allah. And the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all matters is to innovate in religion. And every such type of innovation is a misguidance. And misguidance leads to the hellfire. I begin by greeting my brothers and sisters saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What we're going to be talking about tonight, insha'Allah, is knowledge. And what does Islam say of knowledge? But I beg your forgiveness. I really do not want this to be a traditional talk where I come and I tell you what are the virtues of knowledge. The fact that the very first verse that was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was Iqra. Simply because this is information that you know. Not that I'm going to be telling you something that you do not know. But we will try to take this a step over and instead of talking about the virtues of education in Islam, we want to know what should be the aim of education in Islam. We want to know, but why do we want to know? What is it that we want to know? Now that we know, what does Islam expect you to do with what you know? It is the aim of education that we will be talking about here today and not necessarily the virtues of education and what have. Not that this is not important, but I think the information to it is easily accessible by my brothers and sisters. Let me start by saying, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In a beautiful summary fashion, Allah tells us that there are six reasons why Allah sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-lazina yattabi'oon al-nabiyya al-ummi. الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والأنجيل. Those who follow the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scripture, the Torah and the Injil. What does he do? يأمرهم بالمعروف. He enjoins that which is good. وينهاهم عن المنكر. And he forbids and eradicates evil. ويحل لهم الطيبات. And he declares lawful purities, things that are pure. ويحرم عليهم الخبائث. And he declares unlawful things that are impure. And he relieves them of their burden. And he liberates them of their shackles. One of the missions of Muhammad is that he is a liberator. One of the aims of education, in fact, the most important the ultimate aim of education in Islam is to liberate you. Make you a liberated man and a woman and a free man and a free woman. 
when the slaves were brought into North America and South America, it was illegal to teach a slave reading and writing. A man by the name of Frederick Douglass taught himself to read and write, and then he made a spectacular statement. He said, a man with knowledge cannot be enslaved. Cannot be enslaved. Now, the idea of slavery in Islam is not the stereotypical movie-like image that is presented to us of slavery. Meaning that here is someone that is topless and there is someone holding a whip over him and he is bounded to chains. It is a form of slavery, but it is not the only form of slavery. So Allah says the mission of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to liberate you of your shackles. There are two types of shackles. Shackles that are imposed on us by other people and shackles that are self-imposed. We impose upon ourselves. Shackles imposed on us by other people. Allah says, do not settle down for these shackles. Do not accept these shackles. Allah created you a free man, a woman. You live a free man and a free woman. So liberate yourself of these shackles. He who humiliates himself and was not compelled to do so, meaning that you did not have to, be, to live a humiliated life, and you were not compelled to do so, he is not one of us. You cannot be a life of being you being debased and humiliated and still claim to be a believer. They just don't come together. A believer is a liberated man and a woman, free man and a free woman. So the aim of education in Islam, my brothers and sisters, is to liberate the individual. Like I said, from the shackles that are imposed on us by others and from the shackles that are imposed on us by our own selves. And they say that the hardest enemy to fight is the enemy that you either carry between your ears or the enemy that you carry between your shoulders. It's an enemy, but we're not necessarily aware of it, and we do not see it. And education happens to be, or ignorance happens to be, one of these shackles. See, the problem with shackles, whether they be self-imposed or imposed on us by other people, is that they limit you and they hold you back, and you do not reach your potentials. You have the ability to grow. You have the potential, but the shackles are holding you back. Be they shackles that are imposed by people or be they shackles that you imposed on your own selves. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to liberate you of these shackles. So education is supposed to liberate because ignorance is a shackle. And look around you, subhanallah. You see, the ones that are exploited are the ignorant. And not only that, but it helps to keep them ignorant. Uh, they said that there was a doctor that was treating an older woman for cancer. She thought she had cancer, but she really did not have cancer. And she was a very rich woman. And every time she came to the doctor, of course, she had to pay for the visit. And it was very profitable for the doctor that the woman keeps coming. So what happened is that through time, he himself became a rich man. The woman is coming for 20 years thinking that she has cancer and every time she comes and she gives money. She comes and she gives money. Became so rich, bought a house, sent his own son to medical school and college and high school and his son ended up becoming a doctor himself. So now that the son is a doctor, the father decided to take a two week vacation because the son is taking care of the clinic. During the two weeks when the father was absent, the woman phones in the clinic. She says, I'm not feeling well, and your father usually sees me. So come over, they have an appointment, and he sees the woman, and in 10 days, the cancer was cured. The father comes back to the clinic, and he asks, you know what happened, what did you do? He said, Dad, Father, there was this woman, she thought she had cancer, and in 10 days, I cured her cancer. And the father said, you fool, what have you done? Thinking that you cured her from her cancer. Do you know it was her cancer that sent you to school? 
Do you know that you are a doctor today because it was what she was paying for the assumed cancer and that's why you are where you are? And then he said, son, you started practicing medicine all the wrong way. Why is that? Because it helped him in order for him to stay where he is that she be ignorant. For him to keep the life standards and the status and the caliber and the living standards where he is, she had to remain ignorant. So to her, the ignorance was not only shackling her emotionally and psychologically. You know, imagine someone thinking that they're living with cancer, they could die any minute, but it was also financially exploiting her. And he knew about it, yet he chose not to say anything about it. And that is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the very first verse that was revealed to him, Muhammad, to you and to your ummah, iqra, read. Read or recite in the name of thy Lord. Read. And you would be thinking, this is a nation that was exploited by gambling, alcoholism, and all social ills, and it says, read. Why is this? Because they say, the best line of defense is an educated mind. An educated mind cannot be fooled. An educated mind cannot be exploited. An educated mind cannot be manipulated. So what do you start doing? Teach the people. Recite and read so that they are liberated. So that they think for themselves. So that they're not bounded and they're not confined. You know, they say that, subhanAllah, one of the things that Muhammad sallallahu came and taught that, you know, you, you liberate yourself. It's interesting, through religion, how people can be enslaved. You would think that religion frees people. But some people manipulate religion in such a way that you use religion to enslave other people. The Catholic Church has done it. Now, the only way, the only way to make it to paradise, the Pope has got to be pleased with you. If the Pope is not happy with you, then you are doomed. There is just no way you are making it anywhere. You've got to keep the Pope happy. And guess what? Money makes the Pope happy. Give him money. Give him this. Give him that. The way they financed their lavish lifestyle, the way they financed their this or their that. But then Allah comes in the Quran and tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O ye who believe, in the kathira min al ahbari wa ruhban, laya kuluna amwal al nasib al batil. He said that many amongst the learned men, whether they be priests or rabbis or imams, he said that, ya kuluna amwal al nasib al batil. They take the money of people, ya kulun, they eat the money of the people, bil batil, for no good reason. Other than the fact that these people have gave in to them, and these people are manipulating and molding them and exploiting them because of their ignorance. And that is why, subhanAllah, in Islam, blind faith or blind following is neither accepted nor expected. It is neither accepted nor expected. You are supposed to do this willingly. You are supposed to make an educated choice that I am doing this because it is the right choice. That's why, again, we are told in the Quran, Iqra. Another point also that the Quran makes, and a very interesting one, is that as a believer, you should not be afraid of knowledge. Because in other, you know, previous faith, the way people were exploited is that don't ask questions. And there is a story, and I beg the forgiveness of my non-Muslim brothers and sisters here, especially if they happen to be of the Christian faith, I'm picking on the Catholic Church because I believe that there was a time in history where the church did not represent the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. So this is what I am criticizing and by no means I am criticizing the faith that was taught by Isa alayhi salam. Said that, you know how sometimes kids, I mean, young children, they can have some very, you know, interesting questions. You know, sometimes, you know, your child, your daughter or your son, they come and they ask a question and they really impress you. How did they think of this? So one time, this young kid comes into the church, a Catholic church, and there was the priest, the father. So the young child goes to him and he says, Father, 
I have a question for you. What was God doing before he created us? Now that was, you know, it's a very nice question. And here the child is asking a very provocative question. And the father thought about it. And he knew that this line of questioning is not really good because it may lead to something else. Meaning that you start questioning the authority, you start questioning so many things. So he wanted to put an end to this. And what does he say? He said, son, God was preparing hell for people like you. Again, remember, I am not saying that this is the best that Christian theology had to offer, but I'm just saying that how people can use religion to exploit and to, you know, and to uh, shackle other people. The same thing within the Muslim community, we have this. You know, so-and-so person is a wali. So-and-so person is a magician. So-and-so person is a sorcerer. And be careful. If he ever does a talisman against you, or if he ever does this, so what happens is that people now are again are afraid. But yet comes the Quran, and it liberates people from superstitions. At-tayarat laysat min al-iman. To be superstition, to be pessimistic, or to be any of that, is not part of iman. And you'll see how these people were shackled. A person of them would come and he would have a bird in the morning. If it goes right, it means that was a good omen. If it goes left, it goes, I am doomed today. And you see people, if they break a mirror, that is really bad news. If they spill salt, then that is really terrible. And if you walk under a ladder, then that is really bad. And you must carry a rabbit foot so that it brings you good luck. And in the process, what happens is that you, the person, the human that was creating with intellect, you behave in such a way that is very insulting of your intelligence. Where you think that a piece of rabbit foot or a piece of ladder or a piece of wood or a piece of that can actually help you. Or even for that fact, sometimes we even use the Quran in such a manner. The same thing that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to liberate us from, we are going back into it again and we are enslaving ourselves to it. Doing the exact opposite of the intent and the mission of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, that is not acceptable, my brothers and sisters. So part of education, again, is to liberate us. And ignorance happens to be a great shackle. I gave the example of Congo. When the Belgians came to Congo, they exploited their land for so long. And subhanallah, Africa is a testimony of how ignorance can be a great shackle. You know, in Liberia, just to give you a quick example, the Firestone Company. Firestone Company is a company that is, it belongs to a family. The name is Firestone. It's a family. And what happened is that the Liberia in Southwest Africa, what they did is they leased the land of Liberia. Hundreds upon thousands of acres of rubber tree. Three cents per acre for 100 years. Three cents per acre for 100 years. And they had the rubber trees and they made their fortune and now the people of Liberia are exploited. Similarly, the Belgians, they came in and they exploited that country to the bones. And then when they left, they only built one high school and it was for the children of the Belgians that were growing up in Congo. But the locals were deprived. Simply because the more ignorant they are, the easier it is to exploit them. And Muhammad وسلم, will give the example and he will say, طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة. Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every single Muslim. And the, there is another narration that says every single Muslim, male and female. Some people think that it's a weaker narration. Not only that, but after the battles, when he takes the POWs, the prisoners of wars, and one of them wants to buy his freedom out, what do they do? He would say, do you know how to read and write? We want you to teach 10 of the Muslim children to read and write, and that will be your way of freedom. You look into the Quran, the term ilm is mentioned over a thousand times. Allah speaks of ilm, him being Ali, most knowledgeable. Allah speaks of the believers being knowledgeable. Allah speaks of those who fear him most or who have more awe to him are those who are knowledgeable. And you look into this and you just cannot believe how Islam celebrates the concept of education. Keeping in mind 
that it is for the aim of liberating man and not having man exploited or shackled. Now this is part of the shackles that are imposed by other people on us. There are also the self-imposed shackle upon ourselves. And again, that is really sad. So that a group of people came to Imam Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. Ali ibn Abi Talib was a genius, an extremely, extremely smart man. So one time a group of people, they sat down and they said, you know, Ali is a very smart person. Let us ask ourselves a question, figure out the answer, and then present and pose the same question to Ali and see what he comes up with. And they said, why don't we ask Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, what is the strongest thing that was created by Allah? Beautiful question. They said, let us ask him, what is the strongest thing that was created by Allah? Now here they are debating, we think it's this, we think it's that. Ali walks in. And they said, Ali, we have a question for you. What is the strongest thing that was created by Allah? So Ali right away points out his ten fingers, ten things. As if he has already delivered about the question before and he knows the answer. He started with the obvious. He said, the mountains, they've been there for ages and ages. But you can cut the mountains down with metal. So metal must be stronger. But you can melt down the metal if you use fire, so fire must be stronger. But you can put off fire if you use water, so water must be stronger. But it is the clouds that carry the water, so the clouds must be stronger. But it is the wind that directs the cloud, so the wind must be stronger. The same wind that directs the cloud, if I hold firm to my ground, it will not move me around, so man must be stronger than that cloud. But then he said, the same man that is able to hold firm his ground, if he gets intoxicated, he loses his control over himself. So intoxicants must be stronger. But the same intoxicated man, if he goes to sleep, then that takes care of the intoxicants. But a man with anxiety will never go to sleep. The strongest thing that Allah created is anxiety. <laughs> We are covering the manners in Islam that a Muslim is supposed to have in Islam. There is a strong link between having good manners and piety. And then he said, I guarantee a dwelling in the highest rank of Jannah for the one who perfects his manners. That indeed, truthfulness leads to piety, to righteousness. And righteousness and piety leads to Jannah. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ used to always uh, maintain family ties. Gentleness in Islam means to treat people with kindness and with tenderness. Ali ibn Abi Talib would say, and he would say, why? And you read in the statistics, 50 million Americans, uh, these are the statistics that I know from the States, 50 million Americans suffer from anxiety. So many people are going through depression. So much of this is happening. And anxiety is fear of the future. We don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. And like I said the other day, the Prophet ﷺ would wake up in the morning and he would say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al hammi wal hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from being in the state of anxiety or from being in the state of hazan, grief. I am so sorry about what happened yesterday. I am so worried about what will happen tomorrow. I miss out on living today. I am becoming a prisoner of my memories, a captive of my imagination that I am crippled as of today. But then comes the Quran, says, you know what? Why fear? It is in the heavens that your affairs are being decided. You are in good hands. And that is why, subhanAllah, part of the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is what we call emotional wisdom. You know, sometimes when they hear the word wisdom, what do they think? Intellectual wisdom. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa tells us, what about emotional wisdom? What to feel 
and when to feel it and what is appropriate and what is not appropriate the Prophet ﷺ would say عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Indeed, amazing is the matter of a believer when he is hit with a calamity or when good fortune happens to him, he is grateful to Allah. When something unfortunate happens to him, he is patient. And in both cases, the believer is win. It's a win-win situation. It was said that one time, Imam Abdul Qadir al-Jailani, and some of you may, you know, have a problem with that. But remember that, you know, whenever you can gain benefit, that is what we are taught as Muslims. If there is something beneficial in something that was said or done by someone, take that good thing of them. Ma Abdul Qadir Jilani, great person. One time he is sitting in his masjid and he is delivering a speech. So one of his students or one of the people that work for him, he comes and he interrupts the class. He says, Imam, I am sorry, but I have some terrible news for you. The business, that you know, they used to do business with India and through the sea. He said, great waves came and all your ships have drowned. And whatever was on them is gone. We lost everything. So Imam Abdul Qadir al-Jailani kept quiet for a while, not saying anything. And everyone is waiting to see how he's going to react. Alhamdulillah, he says. And he goes on with the lecture. Few minutes afterwards, the same person comes back and he's all happy. He says, Imam, we were wrong. The ships have already crossed that part and the waves came after the ships, so all the ships are safe. Imam Abdul Qadir al Jalian again kept very quiet. Alhamdulillah, he said. He finished the lecture and then people came after. I said, Imam, you know, when you were given the worst news, you said, Alhamdulillah. And then when you were given the best news, you said, Alhamdulillah, what happened? He said, you know, when I was told, I checked my heart. And I wanted to see, is my heart displeased with Allah because of this incident? And nothing of that happened. So I said, Alhamdulillah. And then he said, when I was given the news, I checked my heart again. Am I loving Allah more because of this thing? Meaning that I can be bought and sold because of uh, some financial gain here and there, which is not befitting to our relationship with Allah. And he said, none of this happened. So again, I said, Alhamdulillah we call emotional wisdom that's why the Prophet ﷺ said calamities happen to everyone we all have problems that is part of life indeed man was created in the state of kabad you know problems all the time what is sad is this my brothers and sisters some of us can only see their problems they can only live their problems what happens is this problems are inevitable they are inevitable. You cannot escape them. Problems are not escapable. You have no choice. Problems are not escapable, but misery is optional. Misery is optional, meaning that it is not the problem that should worry you, but rather how do you react to that problem is a greater question to ask. So now part of what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us is the emotional wisdom. Do not be under shackles because of the type of way that you choose to react to the problems that are going around. Liberate yourself of this. Live a free man. Problems are happening. And like we said the other day, if your problem can be solved, then don't worry. And if your problem cannot be solved, then worrying will not help you. So why are you worried? And then again we learn the Prophet ﷺ will speak of many other shackles. Oh Allah, inability, I'm speaking of emotional wisdom. They say that there was a man that was blind and he was crippled and he just had all sorts of problems. And he's sitting down and he's saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So someone passed by him and said, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, look at you. You're blind, you're crippled, you're bound to this chair and all we hear from you is Alhamdulillah. What are you talking about? So he said, Alhamdulillah that Allah gave me a tongue that is constantly remembering Allah. He said, Alhamdulillah, that He gave me a heart that has accepted the will of Allah. He said, Alhamdulillah, that has given me a body that is patient with the tests of Allah. 
But you know what happened is that you could have said, Oh, la ilaha illallah, look at this and look at that. And you know, and you would give yourself every single excuse to feel miserable. Inna Allah yubghidul bu'sa wa tabaus. Allah hates misery and faking misery or bringing misery upon yourselves. It is not, my brothers and sisters, again, it is not befitting to the character of a believer. Liberate yourself of this. Have what we call emotional wisdom. Similarly, emotional wisdom, some people are just easily angered. And that stops them from achieving. They break many friendships. They are always in problems with their spouses. They're always, you know, they're, they can be triggered by anything. But then the Prophet ﷺ, when time came to his companion, said, Man Whom do you consider to be a strong person? So now the answer is very obvious. They said, Ya Rasulullah, Man rijal They said, Prophet of Allah, it is he who is able to wrestle down other men. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, La, ليس القوي بالسرعة. He said, the strength is not determined by you wrestling other men. He said the strong man is indeed he who has control over himself when he is angered. But we go again, emotional wisdom. Liberate yourself of this. And then the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, of these shackles is ajiz and kasal, inability and laziness. Inability, what it is, is that you have the desire, you have the will, but you have no means. Kasal, laziness, is when you have the means, but you do not have the desires. And the Prophet said, oh Allah, I don't want to be in that situation where I am crippled, where I am shackled, when I am put down. And you know what they say about lazy people? They will always do more work tomorrow. Isn't that what lazy people do? So we will do more work, but tomorrow. They have a funny joke about New Year resolution. You know, some people, they do New Year resolution. They say, you know, inshallah, this coming year, I am going to lose 10 pounds. This coming year, I am going to memorize a Quran. Or this coming year, I will be this. Or this coming year, I'll be that. So there came this person and he said, this year, I will stop procrastinating. Starting from next week. He said he will stop procrastinating, but starting next week. Not immediately, next week. So the Prophet would say, I do not want to be in that situation. Ajiz. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab would say something marvelous. He would say, I cannot see. He said, I just cannot. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min jalad al fasiq. I said, Allah, I seek refuge in you. From seeing or amazing it is, he said that a person who is wicked, they have so much strength and enthusiasm. And a believer is so lazy. He said, it's not acceptable. How is it that a believer can be lazy. One more thing, my brothers and sisters. Laziness is not only physical. Because sometimes we think that it's lazy because, you know, he just doesn't move around. He just wants to sit. And, you know, they have the saying, if you can walk, don't run. And if you can stand, don't walk. And if you can sit, don't stand. And if you can sleep, why be up? Okay. They use this logic. So many times laziness is not necessarily physical. But sometimes laziness can also be mental. You just don't want to think. You give up thinking. You want someone else to do the thinking for you. The same brain intellect that Allah gave you, you gave it up and you surrendered it to someone else. Remember what we said earlier, that Islam is not afraid of people asking questions. It's not afraid. It's all a matter of, you know, just give me proof. You know, the other day, Dr. Zakir made the statement, he said, I, Zakir Naik, if you ever find this in the Bible, I will become Christian. That's what he said. You read into the Quran and it says, Qul in kana lirrahmani waladun, fa'ana awwalul abideen. The Prophet will tell people, say, eh, say, if thy Lord has begotten a son, I will be amongst the first to worship that son. But what is it? Qul hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen. Just show me your proof if you are indeed truthful in what you're making. So believer is never afraid to ask questions. And that is why you hear in the Quran, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ You know, go about the land and see the creation of Allah. Use your fikr, tafakkar, do this and do that. And now that the idea is, it is so sad that us as Muslims, we are intellectually lazy. We let someone else and we depend on someone else to do the thinking for us, but we ourselves, we do not do any thinking. 
you know, they have a story. They said that a group of scientists, they got together. And what they did is that they brought about 10 monkeys into a room. I think monkeys in Urdu are called bandars. So they had 10 monkeys in a room. And then in the room, they placed, like where you see this fan is, they placed some bananas, like hanging from a rope. And there was a table in the room. So if a monkey stepped on the table, easily grabbed the banana. But then what they did is that they put along in the room, they put water hoses, ice cold water. And here is the drill, that every time any monkey makes an attempt to get the banana, they hose the monkey with ice cold water. And not only that monkey, but all the monkeys, they get hosed down with the water. So the first monkey goes to try it and he gets hosed down with the water and all other monkeys, they are now hosed down with the water. So they try it four or five times. So the monkeys say, you know, it seems like every time we try to get up, and get the bananas, we are getting hosed down. So forget it, no one is going to try it anymore. And then what the scientists did is that they took away the hoses, so there was nothing was going to happen. And then interestingly, they took a monkey out and they brought in a new monkey into the room and the bananas are still there. So now the new monkey comes in and what does he see? He sees bananas and monkeys love bananas, right? So he sees the bananas, so what does he do? He steps on the table to get the bananas. But something interesting happened. All the other monkeys, they gang up on him and they start beating him up because they're afraid that they are going to be, you know, hosed down. So now here, you know, the monkey doesn't know why he cannot have the banana. He sees bananas, he loves bananas, but these monkeys obviously don't want him to get the bananas. Then what they did, is that they pulled another monkey out and they put a new monkey in. So now we have two new monkeys and eight old monkeys. The new monkey comes in and what does he see? He sees the bananas again. And he wants to go and grab the bananas, but and all the other monkeys, including the new monkey that was previously beaten up, doesn't know why, they all get together and they beat the new monkey up. Then you can imagine the story goes on to say, a third monkey was brought in, sees the banana, everyone starts ganging up on him, including the two new monkeys. They don't know why they were beaten, but now they're beating this monkey. A fourth monkey, a fifth monkey, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No one has ever been hosed down with the water. They've never witnessed that incident. But because an old monkey did something, the new monkey does not want to think for himself. And sadly, what happens many times is that we behave like the new monkeys. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Wallahi, sadly, we are the new monkey. Where, we don't know why. Just happened to be there. Why do you do this? Allahu A'lam, I don't know. You know? Well, I found my forefathers do it, so it must be good. You know? My dad was a good man. My mom was a wonderful woman. We have a beautiful culture. That's how they do it. That's how we do it. Or do you ever think about it? I don't need to. Someone else did the thinking for me. So in the process, what's happening is that, again, we are putting these shackles around ourselves. And that is a shame, my brothers and sisters. A Muslim thinks. A Muslim analyzes. A Muslim reflects. You know, not only on big issues, politics and history and sociology and all these, but you know what we are told in the Quran? فَلَا يَنظُرُ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Does man not think about what he eats? Don't they look into the heavens, how it is being raised as a canopy? Don't they think? And you see Allah said, think about this. Think about that. Think about this. Think about that. That you should have three hours or divide your day into three different segments. وَسَاعَةً يَتَفَكَّرُ فِيهَا Some time to think. To do some thinking. Rather than being intellectually lazy let someone else do the thinking for you because it can really be a shackle you are capable you are a very smart person but you never gave yourself that opportunity you always thought of yourself very low or you were just plainly being lazy and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say oh allah i seek refuge in you i don't want to be shackled i don't want to be i don't want to have chains around me that are of faqr and kufr. 
فقر means poverty and kufr means disbelief said Allah these are shackles he's saying I don't want to be worried about the future I don't want to be sad about the past I don't want to be lazy I do not want to go through inability I do not want to be in the state of poverty and I definitely do not want to be in the state of disbelief because these are all shackles you see poverty here every day and it is so sad subhanallah so sad to the point where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah, I seek refuge in you. I do not want to be in that stage. Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say, had poverty been a man, I would have killed him. Had it been a man, I would have killed it. Because of the catastrophes that poverty brings. Do you mean to tell me that a poor person, that is just struggling, struggling to make a living, struggling just for that day to pass by, and just put some food in his stomach. This person is analyzing and thinking of the dictators and thinking of the politics and thinking of this and that. He's too busy, too miserable to be in that, to think that way. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, Allah, I do not want to be in that stage. And it is so sad that nowadays, Muslims are the richest and they are the poorest. Some people die of obesity because they eat too much and others are dying of hunger because they have nothing to eat. And here you have the commands of Allah. Anfiqu, you know, give, spend, make sure you alleviate the problems and the hardship of other people because these are shackles. The guy or the girl is very smart. We wish that she could have gone to school. But guess what at this point? What happens is that they cannot afford school. Why one time I remember I went to refugee camps in Eastern Sudan, in the, the Eritrean refugee camps. And there were people sitting in the room, and two of them were medical school students. Now being a doctor is a big deal. Maybe not here, but it was a very big deal to be going to medical school back there. So I said, you know, today is a school day. How come you're not going there? And one of them, he put his head down and he said, I am too hungry. I cannot understand anything if I go there. He could not go to school because he's, I am just too hungry. I cannot go there. And the other one was topless. He said, I don't have a shirt to go to school. I mean, can you imagine the brains, the potentials that are being lost in our cities? Smart, brilliant young boys and girls that can make a huge big difference. But their circumstances are not helping them. So the Prophet ﷺ say, Oh Allah, I don't want to be in that position. And may Allah never put any of us in that position. And then also the Prophet would, and by the way, do not misunderstand me. Islam does not necessarily rebuke poverty for being poverty. But Islam is definitely against poverty if it is due to the injustice of the way wealth is distributed or the way greed is going on. If that is why there is poverty, then yes, Islam hates it and Islam is against it. And if that poverty is again the result of the laziness of that individual, then again, Islam hates that kind of poverty. Poverty is never celebrated in Islam. You are not a good person because you are a poor person. Some people misunderstand zuhud being, you know, a person that is, you know, just very humble, does not have any money. They think that is the meaning of zuhud. True zuhud in Islam is where you have the dunya in your heart, but not in your heart. That is how it is. I have it in my hands. MashaAllah, the Prophet used to say, Ni'mal malu salih lil abdi salih. He said, the best of wealth is that that belongs to the righteous of men. Now you'd see, if he's a righteous man, he should not be wealthy. That's how we were taught. If you're an imam, a sheikh, or a pious person, you're supposed to be miskin. Can't be rich. Cannot accept any of that. But these were not the teachings of Islam.